and we have interviews with different amazing clowns every Wednesday and Sunday. This Sunday we have Caroline Dream who wrote uh, the book The Clown in You and has done many other things. I'll let her introduce herself properly in a second as she'll do it a lot better than I can. Um, I just wanted to mention a massive thank you to our Patreon supporters who support us each um, week, each month with a regular amount. That's Duncan Cameron, Flat Hat, Frankie Anderson, Piero Grandinetti, uh, Ricky Yacop, Tweedy, Zandra, and Yvette Maynard. I apologize if I've completely mispronounced any of your names. <laughs> um, and also for our PayPal contributors who have donated on a one-off basis, uh, which is Davis Bullock, Charlotte Perry Jones, Sarah Slater, Yoti Linux, uh, Jose Rodriguez, Emina Sifa, Lexi Strauss, Adrian Barker, Hilary Chaplin, Duncan Cameron, G. Carroll, Antonella Casella, uh, John Davison, and Rachel Kimro. So thank you very much. If any of you would like to join our Patreon list, uh, which is a regular payment that allows us to pay for everything that we need to run this, like the Zoom contract, etc., then our address is uh, patreon.com slash zoological. Zoological is spelled Z zero uh Z -O -O -L -O -G -I -C -A -L, not zero <laughs> um and yes now that i've gone through the intro and everyone is now in and i've proved my ability to read a script i would like to introduce caroline dream thank you very much for being with us and uh, if you could say a couple of words about yourself that would be great thank you yeah it's a real pleasure to be here i'm British born, but uh, moved to Spain like over 30 years ago. I'm a professional clown, clown teacher, author of a couple of books now. And it's been my life's work basically, as dedicated to this art. I'm, I'm still absolutely passionate about it, absolutely fascinated with it. And it's, uh, it, there's so much more to learn still after 30, woo, <laughs> odd years so it's uh, it's great to be here and be able to talk about what I'm most passionate about <laughs> thank you uh, and also we have a Q&A box for any of the attendees so I'm sure you'll have plenty of questions for yeah. Caroline I definitely do so if you have any if you can ask them in the Q&A box so that I can keep track of them that would be great and I'll feed them in through the conversation but some of them may be left until the end um, but hopefully we'll get through them all um, and I just wanted to ask you as my first question for you, Caroline, is about how you started clowning um, back at, was it full time with Frankie? I, I actually it? started before that. Okay. I, my very first clown gig, I got together with a couple of people and did street work. I um, can't remember when, like back in 1984 or something like that. And we, we produced a clown show that was kind of like a theatrical clown show. So it was a bit too long, a bit too difficult for people to follow on the street. So it didn't really work. And then I tried doing uh, kids shows in schools for a couple of years. And I, ha I had that image. Yeah, I'm a clown, I put on a nose. But again, didn't really work. I wasn't making people laugh. And so that's when I thought, mm, I really need to, to learn about clowning, about this technique, because I really don't understand it. It's finding it really difficult. And so that's when I went to full time and studied under Frankie and spent maybe three or four years in full time study. I mean, I did the first year long course, which included acrobatics and other things, uh, well, everything, because it was a circus school. But after the first year, I continued focusing on impro and on clown technique. Um, but I really didn't get it. <laughs> it took me years to understand how to really let go of my defenses, of my masks, my barriers, and to be authentic on stage. It took me a long, long time to understand that. I, put, I say in my, in my defense that uh, I was a female clown, and I didn't have really any, anybody around me. I didn't know anybody who 
was doing comedy on the television as well. At, the, at that time, there was no female comedian. So I didn't have any role models. So it was kind of like trying to invent things without having any clear idea of, you know, oh, I could wear a dress or, you know, there was, there was a, lot of, a lot of issues that I had to discover for myself. I'm sure there were other clowns around. I know that, um, you know, there's been female clowns for a long time, but I just didn't know any. So it was, it was more complex. <laughs> well, I knew Frankie, because she was actually performing. So yes, one or two. You know, we've had quite a few previous panelists mention about their, about the lack of female teachers and performers that they could see regularly and how a lot of them were breaking barriers. Um, and you've done that as well now. You are teaching a lot and obviously writing books. Um, could you tell us a little bit about what inspired you to start teaching? I think you've hinted at kind of already. Well, you know, I, I always was attracted to teaching. Even at full time, I started teaching uh, the children. They invited me to teach children acrobatic skills. And so, I mean, I, I always wanted to teach. Even when I was just out of theater school, I wanted to teach. So I learned something and then immediately wanted to, to, to share it with other people. So that's, that's how I started really. But then when I realized that I didn't really understand clowning, I didn't teach clowning. Oh, I taught impro skills. I taught other types of skills. When I arrived in Barcelona, it was do or die. So I had to do some teaching. I did work on the street for many, many years. Started off in the Rambler, which I'm sure all of you know, the Rambler of Barcelona. Unfortunately, you can no longer perform there. But at the time that I arrived in Barcelona, it was legal. And so I did spend many years honing my art, understanding my craft out there on the street. And then 21 years ago, I decided to start teaching with my husband, Alex Navarro, who was working with Cirque du Soleil at that time. And they invited him to teach the artists in Cirque du Soleil clown technique, because they had lots of Russian, you know, uh, amazing acrobats and performers, gymnasts, Olympic gymnasts. But the director was a bit worried about how wooden they were on stage, you know, that, you know. And so he wanted a bit more kind of clown technique in, in te taught to these Russian acrobats. And we had an absolute ball. We did about four trainings with the Cirque du Soleil artists. And of course, on the physical level, they were so talented. So basically what we had to do was, was allow them to play more and allow to you know, laugh at themselves. And they really didn't have any problem with it at all. They were natural. And so we, we had such fun. We enjoyed ourselves so much that we thought, yay, can we carry on with this? And then, so I taught by his side for 16 years. We did a kind of clown duo teaching act, <laughs> which worked really well because he had lots of elements that I didn't have and we, we fed and learned from each other over those 16 years. And it was wonderful, absolutely wonderful. And then after 16 years, I began to feel like we were living, breathing, eating, working, you know, everything together. And I said to him, it would be really good to, you know, have something to talk about <laughs> over the dinner table. And uh, as he was directing more at that stage, well, and I took on all the clown workshops for a while. So yeah, that's the process that we went through. Okay, and um, obviously you mentioned teaching at Cirque du Soleil. You, teach, you moved to Barcelona from the UK and went straight into street performing. Um, how? How do you find that kind of the culture of performing and teaching in those places? Maybe performing first, and then we can talk about teaching. Uh, the culture of teaching from the UK moving over to Barcelona is, I know that I, it feels very different when you watch different artists. And I can't imagine how it feels performing in those different places. Well, it was amazing. I mean, the, 
the Rambler at that time, people used to go, I mean, I don't know if they do that so much anymore, but they used to just, every Saturday and Sunday, they'd take their family out and walk up and down the Rambler, knowing that there were, you know, little shops with birds and plants, but also a whole load of street artists doing performances. So they really went to see the street artists. And so we had absolutely huge crowds right from the beginning, you know, and I <laughs> basically had performed once or twice on the street as an acrobatic duo in Bath, because that was like the closest place that we could perform in, in a, to Bristol. And suddenly I was kind of out on the street in Barcelona with these immense crowds gathering around and you could do anything and nothing and you'd still have a huge crowd. So it was a real luxury at that time. And I got together with a German juggler that I'd met at full time and we did a clown juggling monocycle routine, which at that time as well, there were very few other circus artists the level of circus was very low, fortunately. <laughs> so we got out a huge uh, unicycle and everybody in the crowd would immediately gather around because they'd never seen anything like it before. Um, of course now, mm, Spain, Catalonia in, in particular, has the highest level of circus, circus you could ever imagine. It's just, over the last 30 years, it's just exploded and so I was lucky. I moved here when things were just beginning. You know, we all used to meet in this place called the Ateneo in Lumbares, which has now become an immense circus school. But at that time, it was just like this alternative place where when it rained, the water just came right through and watered down on us all. Um, but that, you know, that was like where all the circus people gathered, which we were maybe like 30 people in general, where we practiced juggling skills, tried out clowning things. And so it was a small community that I could join immediately. And even though I couldn't speak Spanish, because I came here without a word of Spanish, I did speak Italian. And so through sign language and the common joy of working with circus skills, I created a lot of intimate friends from at that time who then became the big stars uh, on the Catalan scene and on the world scene, I would say as well. So it was an amazing period of growth and community and sharing. And it was, it was a wonderful, wonderful time to come to Barcelona. Also because, you know, we were moving towards the Olympic games so there was a lot of money being poured into Barcelona. I came in 89 and the Olympic Games were in 92. So over three years, it was just like, wow, you know, people were growing exponentially. And there was a lot of work, which was great. <laughs> that does sound amazing. And like having all of those people coming to watch. Um, how was it? You also went over to Latin America um, as well. Did you perform in Latin America? Really? Not as much. I, occasionally I would be invited over, but it was, it was more complex to be invited from here to there. But again, there, it, you could just go out on the street, there's a ball and everybody's... <laughs> and I was also invited to perform in festivals. And again, it was amazing the amount of the public that there was, the audience and participatory as well they were just like so hungry for it and so so happy to see and be made to, to laugh it was a real pleasure to be in Latin America work. I should think that still it is you know my experience in Latin America in general is that they they really really appreciate clowns they love them they they're part of their their, their, their culture so it's, you know, then there's a lot of work for clowns, so they're well appreciated. And here too in Spain, which is why I stayed. I have the feeling that uh, clowns got, clowning has gone through like a movement in England and now is more appreciated than ever. But here, even back then, I arrived here and it was, uh, it was amazing the, the, the respect I felt from the public for my work. I mean, really, it was completely different from, from England at that time, at least. 
the respect for clowns and, and the work that we were doing. That sounds great. I can definitely understand why you chose to stay. Um, how do you ever kind of return to England to teach or perform or anything? Or? I've tried, but it is, um, it's really difficult in that I'm not really well known on the English speaking circuit. You know, my, my big fan base, if you want to call it that, uh, the people that know me and have worked with me are Spanish speakers because I've spent a lot of time working in Spain and in Latin America. And because I connected all my work with my husband at the, at the earlier period, we basically created the webs, everything was in Spanish. I even wrote my first book in Spanish, which is crazy. <laughs> uh, and then translated it into English. So uh, basically, uh, my name is not as well known in, in, in English language communities than, than it is in Spain. And, and it's, so it's more difficult, more difficult to fill workshops or to get bookings as a clown. So. I haven't actually been back to England to teach or clown since I left, sadly to say. <laughs> well, that's quite a long time and quite a shame for England. Yeah, I really, uh, I would love to, I would love to, really. Well, fingers crossed that maybe we can make it happen uh, post-coronavirus post when we can travel oh, again, yeah. hopefully. Um, you mentioned writing your book in Spanish first um, and then translating it to English. Uh, I was wondering kind of what the process of writing your first book and uh, your upcoming book, if you can talk about that, and, yeah, that would be great. Um, but kind of the process of writing the book, why you decided to write the book, um, kind of how you go about all of that, because the idea of writing about clowning feels very intimidating to a lot of us, I think. Oh yeah, it certainly was when I first started. I mean, I'd been teaching for 10 years and, and I was kind of quite frustrated that I couldn't tell my students, look, read, go and read these books, you know, or there was a few books on the market, but very, very few. There's many more now, thank God. But at the time it was like, uh, how, do I, how do I tell my students more? Because I've specialized in intensive two-day courses. So, a lot of the courses that I run have been just two days. And of course, what can you say in two days? You know, you're quite limited in terms of all the information that a student needs. And even if they come back and back and back, you still, I still found that there was so much that, that, that I couldn't say in classes that I wanted to, to help them with. And so basically I started writing the book for me. You know, it was like, uh, well, I'm gonna hand my students some you know, leaflets and stuff that they're interested in. So I got this huge pile of notebooks that I had been writing over many, many years, all the classes that I'd ever taken, I always took notes. So I had masses and masses of notebooks with information and I just looked at all this information and thought, my God, what am I gonna do with all this, you know? It just looked like, it was like looking at a plate of spaghetti and then trying, you know, trying to put every piece of spaghetti in one line. And even that sounds easy to what, it had, what I had to do. Because I felt basically I didn't really know how to, to structure all the information in a cohesive way. I think writing about clowning, that is the most difficult thing to do. What, what bit of information goes where? And that has been really the, the greatest struggle, that creative struggle, I must say, because it is creative and there is a lot of pleasure in, in doing it. Um, that's why I've spent five, six years writing each book, because it was just like, hmm, I don't really know where that piece of information goes. So leave it for a, few, for a while and, and think about it and mull over it. And I worked a lot on intuitively in terms of, uh, hmm, I wonder why that is. So I'd go and ask my students, I'd give my students um, polling sheets or I'd ask them to write down stuff about it or I'd interview them about questions that I didn't know the answer to or I'd talk to other clown teachers 
or I'd try out experiments in my classes to see if what I thought was true was true. So I, I spent a, a lot of time just investigating different aspects. Also, like a good clown, going off on the branches and getting lost in why is that funny, you know, or, you know, and so investigating in psychology books and um, humor books and all sorts of things. I did masses and masses of investigation. And it was an absolute joy. I mean, I learned so much. I have learned so much writing books. I really recommend it because what you don't know and you're interested in, then you find out about it and then in able to be able to write about it, which I always wanted to sort of put it down in paper afterwards, all this amazing information. So that's what led me into it. And, and that's why it took me so long to write because each book has been like a, a deep dive into where, hey, this is interesting and that's interesting. And allowing myself time to just let it happen, you know, let it come. And it does take time because it is, as you say, I mean, well, it's just this huge, huge puzzle and with lots of different parts and lots of people have other parts. I'm just talking about what I know and what I've investigated, but I'm, I'm well aware that there's just masses that I don't. I've just spent lockdown, in fact, talking to 40 different clown um, teachers around the world about their parts of the puzzle. And I've really discovered amazing things that on my next book <laughs> so I won't sure share that now but um, my investigation continues so to speak <laughs> you mentioned a little bit about your next book is there any information that we can glean out of it maybe an exclusive um, well, I'll, I'll tell you about my first book and my second book my first book is called The Clown in You and that was directed at beginner students so I really had in mind people who didn't know anything about clowning. And so I gave them the basics. And then when I finished that, I thought, well, I told everybody everything that I know. Um, but then I spent another five years trying out new classes. I'm always inventing new stuff, new courses to run. And within that, finding out bits of new bits of technique. And so the second book I've called Clown Yourself, and it's coming out at the end of this month, beginning of June, at the latest. It will be coming out in Spanish first, though I did write the second book in English, thinking, no, <laughs> do not be so crazy. Uh, <laughs> and so I wrote it in English first and then translated into Spanish. And the second book is directed more to intermediate students, clown teachers. It's got 38 exercises, 100 games, well, 100 games, but games. Uh, lots more information about how I teach and uh, why I give certain instructions. And so it really breaks down my teaching method for people to find out about what, what we do out down around here in Spain. Because there are a lot more clown teachers here in Spain that have been going for 20 odd years. And we are... Uh, we're friends, so we talk to each other, we, we share information, and basically I've done classes with most of them as well, and we all have a very similar style of teaching. It's kind of like a, a teaching that's come from Lecoq and grown and warped and changed and, and incorporates a lot of the things that were either performing or seeing being performed. So we inform each other all the time. And we call it clown here, not payaso, which would be the word to use in Spain. You know? We call it el arte del clown, which seems a bit odd to all most English people because clown is clown, yeah? But for we, we maybe 30 years ago, need, needed a new word or a modern clown performance. We needed kind of a, a word that could uh, put aside that, uh, you know, payaso is what 
people used at that time to, it was in a derogatory way, much as how clown has been used in England. So in order to kind of differentiate ourselves from that idea, we used, started using the word clown. And I still use the word clown as my clown courses. Um, and then not payaso, though in my book, I, I explain to the Spanish readers, at least, that for me, it's the same thing. You know, but it was just a, a need at that time that we had in order to kind of say, we are not, uh, we don't just put on our makeup and our costume and do this kind of, I'm a clown. Uh, it goes in a very different direction and it, and it goes inwards rather than what's on the outside. Um, do you think that, well, do you think that something similar could happen in the UK that maybe, or maybe we don't need to use another word, we do need to use another word, because clown is still used derogatorily here a lot yeah. about the government quite often. <laughs> um, how do we kind of take it back? Do you have any suggestions for how we take well, it back? I was talking to Frankie the other day and she uses fool. Uh, and she, she recognized that, she, you know, she used fool for the same reasons we use clown in a way to kind of separate from the image of uh, the false, uh, superficial Ronald McDonald type clown, yeah? Um, so, yeah, you could definitely use another word, though I don't think it's really necessary. I'm beginning to hear now from people who are living in England that clown is becoming more and more uh, an accepted idea that is the new modern clown. Well, anyway, that's what I hear. I know that there's a clown festival started in London, which is just great. It's great that um, it's beginning to come back as uh, an art and a, an important thing that people might be interested in going to see, not just the stand-up comedians that have taken over the world in England, haven't they really? or taking over the comedy scene. So it's good to come back to the heart. I think the, the clown works from the heart in a way that uh, some of the comedians uh, work from there. Yeah, work from the ideas, the, the brain. So it's very different art form. And I think it's, it's a beautiful art form that, that can really, basically now, this is what we need. I'm feeling it more and more, you know, people are gonna come to clowning because they're gonna need the connection that clowning gives them to themselves, to others, and to the world. I, w I wish that I asked that question later because that would have been a wonderful way to close the interview. Yeah. I'll come back to that later. <laughs> Wait, can you edit it so that that gets? <laughs> yeah, that would be great. Um, I will ask some of the audience questions uh, now because we've got quite a few already. Um, we have. One from Adele Adel, Adela, um, asking, what do you suggest for solo practice? Does it make sense to practice alone or is it better to, is it better to be with an audience all the time? Well, I think it's, in, it, it's essential to be able to practice on your own. I mean, that's how you create material and that's how you rehearse material. Uh, obviously an audience is super important to be a clown, a clown needs an audience, but uh, there is an actor as well involved in creating clown material. So that's, that's the part where you work on your own. It's hard. It's, uh, I, I really recommend that you have a, an external eye, even if it's just another clown. Uh, I would even recommend that something that I do on my clown courses, but that you can do these days with Zoom, which is, to have a, another clown watching what you're doing and then imitate what you've just done because clowns often take the material that they see and they may transform it into something much more comic. So you're doing something that you rehearsed, which is a bit more cardboard, then they imitate it. Then you could even imitate what they've just done. So you could, you could really go on a, on a roll with that. And, and uh, all the time you can film yourself on Zoom as well, which is great. So I used to think that clowning online would be, 
really difficult, especially teaching clown online, but I'm beginning to think that that's not the case, that this format works in a different way, but you have to kind of start playing with the comedy of the camera, yeah, hey, or you're going down, you know, using the comedy of this format. And I think it's totally, totally essential that, that you can work on your own. I used to, I've, I've done a lot of solo shows and to, in order to work on them, I've spent, you know, locked myself in a studio and, and gone over and tried things out, filming myself always to be able to see what I've done. And also not to have to be the outside eye as well. So if you're filming yourself, you can just let go and play and then you can watch it later and you can be your own outside eye. It's a bit more difficult because you tend to be more critical about what you do than somebody who, who is a friend of yours or a director. That's my answer. So wonderful answer and I think a lot of us will be doing that um, very soon. Uh, I have another question from Chia, Tiara, Chiara Thorburn asking um, in relation to what you were saying about taking notes earlier, um, do you think there is a capacity to over intellectualize clown? Some teachers in the past have encouraged me to stop taking notes and to just go with it. Uh, what do you think? Can we think about clowning too much? Oh, definitely, definitely can think about it too much. I mean, I, what I realized after years of training and training and training with other teachers was that. I was actually missing out on getting out there and just doing it. I think it's really, really important to just get out there and do it. However, in my clown courses, I'm really aware that people want to take notes and some people need to take notes because they want to try out my exercises in other spaces or, or they, you know, they hear something that that's not necessarily what I say, but could be something that's kind of relevant to them. So I encourage them to take notes in the breaks and to help each other remind each other of what we've done or if they need to be reminded, they can always come to me because I've usually written something down about what, what we've been doing. And so I, I basically ask them to, to be in the moment, to be present for the other people that are, are working on stage and not to be there taking notes, but to do that in the breaks so they most people can remember what they've done in the last two hours. So, I, you know, you don't miss out that much. And then there are moments when we're just sitting around in a circle and then they can take notes there and then if they need to. But most of the time people don't come to me and go, oh, I can't remember what we did. No, most people do remember what they did. And also because it's something that you live, you know, it's an, an experience of, and you don't forget that in your moment. I mean, I can still remember things that I did in clown courses that just left a huge mark on me that you don't really need to write down. So for me, clowning is about that. It's about an emotional learning experience, an active participatory learning experience. And you really do need to be in the moment. It's true. But I'm, I'm aware that people like me, I needed to write notes. And I'm glad I did because from that came a brilliant book, The Clown in You. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay, I have one question leading on from what you just said about um, how certain things in classes can really impact you, etc. I apologize if this is a really difficult question, but do you have a particular exercise that you find really resonates with you? Um, that's something that's really interesting to me how certain clowns really love certain exercises and they really resonate with them. So I was just curious if you have one that you'd be willing to share with us. Ah, well, I like exercises that are really simple in terms of like the, the structure that they're, they, I'm given, like come on stage and you have two minutes to do whatever you want. I like exercises like that now. I hated them when I started because it was like, what? What am I going to do? But obviously after 30 years, it's like, wow, thank you. Let me just follow my instinct and let me listen to the audience and let me play and let me feel and let me you know, do whatever I want. Yeah, great. So now I love that. I mean, I spent a year doing Impro Clown for 
for audiences in a, in a theatre in Barcelona uh, with a group of four other women. So we were five clowns performing. And, and that was that. It was like uh, structures that were very, very simple that allowed us to just do what we wanted and, and use all our skills and techniques. But if you ask me what I like best as a teacher, well, one of the latest exercises that my husband has invented, so this is hot off the press, is a fantastic exercise, okay? There's a clown who comes on with a balloon onto stage and they have to connect with the audience. They have to create, engage the audience in whatever way they can. And there's another clown behind the stage with a huge knitting needle. And when that clown feels that the energy in the room is going down and maybe the, the, the clown on stage is struggling, doesn't know what to do or isn't engaging the audience in some way or other, they come on very slowly with their knitting needle. So they give that extra edge to the clown. Uh, instead of me having to shout, come on, I'm, you know, whatever. There's this clown in the background coming up, which immediately raises the energy in the, in the audience because they're like, ooh, <laughs> you know, the dynamic completely changes. And so if the energy goes up again, the clown has to go off again with the knitting needle. So they come on again until, of course, if it goes down too much, then they burst the balloon and that's the end of the scene. So it is a simple, simple exercise, but it is pure genius. Alex Navarro invented that one. Excellent. That sounds amazing. I really, I really want to see that exercise. I can't wait the way next year workshop and hopefully someone does it. Um, you mentioned your show uh, that you did with all different women clowns. That ties in very nicely to a question from Susan Broadway, um, Sue Broadway, um, who's asked, can you talk a little bit about the female clown in Spain and any differences you see culturally? Um, well, it's been amazing here because we've had female clown festivals. Yeah, there's a, an amazing female clown called Pepe Plana, who, who, along with Tortel Portrona, who is the founder of Payaso Sin Fronteras, Clans Without Borders, they got together and convinced the local government in Andorra to start off a clown festival. This was well, I don't know, in the 90s, it was years ago now. And we had this amazing, I mean, they invited all the clown, female clowns that were around here in Catalonia and in Spain, and a few of the international circuit. And we were literally 200 odd clown, female clowns at that first and second festival. I mean, it was a real eye opener. Suddenly it was like, oh my God, we are crawling out of the woodwork. <laughs> there were so many of us and we had such a feeling of camaraderie and uh, wow, what are you doing? And, you know, there was workshops. Angela de Castro came and directed one of our first cabarets in one of those festivals. Uh, you know, it was just suddenly opening up to the talent and quality of work that was out there within our community, the female clown community. And from then we just carried on, you know, it was like the festival uh, lost its funding after a few years, but we, it had already created an energy between us that was um, unstoppable basically. And in my clown classes, I see it, you know, like I started off teaching male clowns who wanted to be professionals and there was like maybe like one or two females in a group of 20 and about 10 years ago that completely changed so more and more women came in and then oh during a period of maybe eight years there were 18 clowns and two men two 18 female clowns and two two men and now it's come, become an equal thing again. So there's half women, half men coming to my courses. 
So basically for many years, women just kind of woke up and went, hey, what's this? Um, and it's just been an amazing, amazing experience to have all these women together um, finding their comedy or, or I mean, I think, I think we've always had massive, you know, amazing comedy as women, but it's, it's like not just finding it, but getting out there and doing it in front of an audience. Because here in Spain, uh, we are, or were, maybe even are, way behind in terms of how the culture sees female clowning. When I started, there were, you know, if you're in Barcelona, that's okay, no problem. But you go out into Leida, one of the, the little communities out in, the, uh, in Catalonia, and it was a different story. You, you know, we, women just weren't seen as that. You couldn't, you know, women were like put on a pedestal, but on a, you know, a beauty pedestal. They were like, yeah. and so it was really, really difficult to, to break through those cultural norms. I mean, Spain has been going through a sort of trying to catch up with the rest of Europe over the last, uh, 30 years that I've been here in terms of female equality it's getting there but it keeps it keeps sliding as well because there are well, a lot of very right-wing like Vox you know, this is unbelievable that they went through this dictatorship for so many years and then now Vox is a, like a right extreme right, the right wing party that want to like get women back in the home and get rid of abortion and all that sort of stuff and then becoming popular again so there are you know this this crusted encrusted part of society that still hankers after women being put in their place so uh i don't think that's going to happen <laughs> i hope it's not going to happen anyway Hopefully not. Um, one of the themes of Clown Power, uh, Clown Power Live, is kind of the power of clowning. Uh, you mentioned Vox. Do you think that clowning can be used as a way to kind of fight against the rising populism, not just in Spain, but here in the UK and, to be honest, most of the world? <laughs> I have come to believe that clowning or clowns can fight in areas and ways that it's, even fight isn't the right word. It's like they can transform situations and transform people in a way that other people can't. Uh, I've heard so many stories. I've talked to so many people, especially in Latin America, who are way advanced on this because they've been uh, using social clowning, uh, clowning in, well, in, in very poor, very unequal areas. They've been training people from those areas in clown technique and seeing how that transforms their lives. They become empowered, they become, uh, they, they become able to see the world in a completely different way. How clowns have gone to refugee camps. Uh, I mean, this, there's so much transformation in the clown world now in terms of reaching out to the community and seeing how their work affects that community in a really positive way. In fact, I'm now going to start interviewing people who are doing hospital clowning, doing social clowning, humanitarian clowning, and corporate world clowning. <laughs> because uh, I feel that there's, you know, the, the, there's so much knowledge that they have that hasn't been shared yet on the world stage. So I'm really, 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 really fascinated by the stories that I've heard so far and moved. In fact, in my new book in uh, Clown Yourself, there's a whole section which is, runs onto many pages on how clowns, make other people feel great and how clowns have affected other people and why that is so. You know, there's, I've found many, many different reasons why clowns 
clowns and clowning transforms people. Yeah, I look forward to getting the chance to read that um, at some point. I am aware that we've only got about 10 minutes time, so I'm going to select a couple of questions um, from the audience. And I also wanted to ask you a little bit about corporate clowning, but I'll go to the audience questions first. Um, Ben Cornish asks, uh, when you speak of investigating to feed your writing, are you asking very specific questions or do you talk in a general way and then draw material out from that? I do both. I reach roadblocks in my writing that they go like, oh, I don't know what that is or I'm, you know, I'm really interested to know what the students feel about this. So I will write specific questionnaires that are focused on one aspect of clown. So for instance, one of the things that I needed to know was, okay, so we all talk about play and clown, but what does that actually mean for people? What does that actually mean for the clown students? So I wrote a questionnaire where I you know, asked them, define play for me, please. And then very specific questions around that. that. And the answers were fascinating. And from that, you know, I got lo lots of uh, insight in terms of like the differences between what I say when I say, okay, so play as a clown and what they're actually understanding. So that is really important as well to start asking questions, specific questions to the students. But I also, especially in interviews, especially when I was interviewing the professional clowns, I just, the great thing was uh, I thought that I was going to have to have a whole list of long questions to ask the, the clowns, but actually clowns love to talk about their arts, they're passionate, they're, they're poetic. They're, so in a lot of ways, it's just kind of like throwing in a, a question in terms of like uh, what you're hearing and asking them to explain it a bit more deeply. So I stand back in my interviews quite a lot and, and allow the clowns to just say what they need to say because it's always, always, always fascinating. So a bit of both, a bit of both. Thank you very much. That's very, very insightful and hopefully useful to quite a lot of us, definitely to me right now. <laughs> um, uh, I think it's Sophie Maxwell Stewart has asked, um, what do you think the red nose means to clowning? This is actually quite a big question. Well, it's, it's, it is an, it's a huge question. Personally, I am not sacred with the red nose. Uh, I use it in my clown classes and I've used it as a clown. But for many years, coming from England, where red, the red nose was kind of like you know, you put on a red nose and you automatically, you know, it was a bad thing at, at the time back in the 80s. So I didn't use a red nose when I was performing and didn't when I arrived here either. I spent 25 years working without the red nose. But then when I came here, everyone was wearing a red nose. And in Latin America, everyone wears a red nose. And so slowly but surely, I began, I began to really, really appreciate the value and see how, how transformative putting on a red nose can be for people. So I use it all the time in my clown classes because I see how it helps people connect with the frequency of clown. But I'm not sacred about it. I know that there's a lot of people who, you know, you've got to always turn around to put on your nose and, you know, even in a clown class and I because it's like something that you can actually you know you can you know I've seen clowns take off their red nose in improvisations and it's been hilarious and, and I'm not you know like I think you can do that I don't think that you uh yeah I think the red noses should be as uh, it, it should be as free as anyone wants to be. I mean, here we are, we're in clown world, we're talking about freedom, and we're talking about allowing ourselves to just, you know, be, go, be ourselves and go crazy. So why, why can't we also play with the nose? So I, that's what I feel. And I know that there's people that feel very differently about it. And I really respect everybody's point of view around the red nose. But I think 
and it's it's a useful tool, but sometimes it can come it can work in a it can be be a bad thing, you know, because some people see the red nose and immediately like, okay, so you know they have this preconceived idea, and me and my husband never wore a red nose precisely for that, so that we'd go out on the street, he would wear it. It's just a suit. Um, yeah, a little bit of makeup, but not very much. So everything that he did was like a shock, you know, and it was surprising for people rather than people going, oh, you're going to make us laugh. Okay, so, you know, sit there. So instead it was like, oh, God, there's this really weird person walking around in a suit. They're doing odd things, you know. So it was, it was a very different idea way in to the client. Very interesting, potentially controversial, <laughs> um, but definitely very interesting. Um, yeah, you, when we spoke previously, uh, you mentioned that you do a lot of corporate clowning now, which is something that is quite new. Um, and I think it's something that a lot more clowns and organized corporations in the UK, at least, are beginning to explore. And I was wondering how that you're finding it in Spain and kind of what you feel that people hiring you get out of it and what you get out of doing it kind of so let me just clarify that i don't go into what i do workshops in businesses for um, businesses i don't go in and perform though i do know people on on the spanish here in spain who do that who are hired to go in to observe people in the different areas and then in a conference or whatever give them feedback in a, as a clown on what they've seen. So I go in to teach applied clowning. It's, so it's not, so I don't go in trying to train them as, to be clowns. I tr train them in the soft skills that businesses need, which means basically humanity skills, you know, how to be more human, how to create syn, syn energies with other departments how to be more accepting, how to be less focused on goal, 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 and, and so frightened of failure that they can't even be creative anymore. So there's a lot of aspects that are my trainings, depending on what they want out of me, I will focus more on one thing or another. So I've been doing some great trainings with people. People are like, wow, they're blown away in businesses because basically they've never had this opportunity to see each other in, in that way. And many of them are absolutely surprised by how, uh, how much talent, how much skill and how much humor each other have, you know? And so it's, it's sad in a way that they haven't seen that and that hasn't there's been no space in the businesses for that. Um, and it really, really, really does help people be able to see that the other people have many, many talents that they are not allowing themselves to, to, to use because of the cultural, the culture in the business is not, and not allowing people to really flourish. And that is changing now. It has been changing for many years. So for me, the, the whole fact that I can go in and train with clown technique in businesses is, is revolutionary. It's like, whoa, uh, businesses are changing because they're beginning to see the value in using red nose skills. I call it clown mode. People being in clown mode at work rather than in serious mode. That sounds very good. Yeah, I can definitely think of some people that I know who work for corporate organizations who would benefit a lot from that. Send them a link to this video as a minor promotion. Go, go hire Caroline. Um, we've got just one more minute or so until uh, we reach the end of this section uh, we'll be speaking a bit afterwards. Um, so Dave will promote everyone up as panelists. I just wanted to ask you one last question from Jean, Jean 
Pablo, I apologize if I mispronounced your name there, um, he said since the crowning you, he would like to know um, what your dreams are that you mentioned in there. Uh, would you be willing to share some of them? My dreams? Yeah, Whoa. that's a big question. Things have changed a lot, hey, since coronavirus hit the world. Like I was just struggling along, being creative, following my own intuition, uh, expanding, trying out new things, going into businesses, blah, 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 blah. And suddenly all that came to a halt. And my husband got coronavirus. So we've had it in the house and it's out there. Catalonia has been hit harder than so many places. And so my dream, my dream is that we've all learned something from this experience. I certainly have. And that the world has learned something, the world leaders above all, and that there will be changes, positive changes come out of this or when we get out of it, if we ever get out of it. <laughs> but that's my dream. I really do dream for a better world. That's what I'm, why I'm in clowning, because I am here to help you know, and create that better world, even in the little drop of rain and the little sand that I'm trying to do. So. That's the better world. That's my dream. Oh, that's a wonderful way to close this session. Thank you very much. Um, I will keep a copy of the questions that we haven't had the chance to answer and um, maybe ask Caroline if she could write an answer to some of them. Um, we've now got kind of half an hour uh, to just kind of hang out all together. Caroline, you're welcome to stay if you'd like. Uh, you don't have to, but before we begin that, uh, Dave and I just wanted to sing happy birthday to Angela de Castro. Um, so if we could all do that, that would be wonderful. So please, at the moment, most of you are unmuted, um, but we'd really like you to all join in. Uh, so unmute yourselves, and uh, yeah, everyone's been added. We will start in about 30 seconds. If you can't figure out how to unmute yourself, at the bottom of your screen, there should be a picture of a microphone. Uh, so if you could do it there, that would be great. Uh, nearly everyone's unmuted. Am I able? No, I'm not. I'm not currently a host, Dave, um, so I can't unmute people. Um, who can't themselves. Uh, if you want to come up on to video, uh, you're more than able to. We've uh, uh, brought you on as panelists, so you are welcome to speak and to be on video. Sharon, start singing. Uh, one, two, one, two, three. Two. Happy, Happy birthday. birthday. <laughs> Happy birthday, Happy birthday, Angela, Angela, with Echo and Delight. Happy, Happy birthday, birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. you. Oh, behind me. Oh, behind me. Thank you very much. <laughs> I'm so embarrassed now. Oh, behind me. <laughs> thank you, guys. Thank you. And thank you, Caroline. That was very inspiring. Uh, and for me, Caroline, very big present to hear you and to get to see you and to meet you this way. Um, okay. Hello. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I do would like to invite Caroline to come to the Why Not Institute. Okay. I assume it's all over and uh, you can come over, can travel. It will be lovely to have you here. Woohoo, England, I'm coming to England. Uh, it will be lovely, <laughs> Caroline, if you can come to the to London, you know, I can uh, host you here. Oh, so, oh, thank you, Angela, that would be so great. Oh, uh, I, I feel very moved to meet you and to hear you, because I think we are on the same lines. And we, we you know, by hearing you and reading a book, you know, we we believe on the same thing, similar things, you know, so it would be lovely to be together and to experiment more and to exchange and 